All right, so this problem is called random integers from random bits. Uh, so I actually wrote this problem myself and I'm pretty proud of it. In the past, I, we, I would use these like complicated randomized algorithms problems, but then I sort of realized that the only thing that's gonna be tested is problems like this, where you're gonna deal with these algorithms that have the same pattern. The pattern that I like to call these is randomly, yes, Check answer, repeat. All right, this is pretty much the most common class of randomized algorithms you will see. Um, yeah, so I, I actually helped write a lot of the midterm problems and uh, I can guarantee there's gonna be problems that look exactly like this. Um, yeah, so this is a very common pattern. The reason is, is because these algorithms are easy to analyze, right? The run, the quick sort one is very hard to analyze. This one is much easier to analyze. So that's why most exam problems look like this. So let's talk about this. We're gonna generate random numbers, random integers precisely, by generating random bits, okay? So, you, you know, in CS, everything kind of boils down to a bit. So when we talk about sources of randomness, we look to the most simplest possible source of randomness, which is just a random bit, zeros or ones. And it's essentially like flipping a coin. Here, we're going to assume that you can generate a bit using O of one time, which makes sense, right? It takes a constant time to flip a coin. Now, part A asks us to design an algorithm that generates a uniform integer S in the range from zero all the way up to n minus one, so not including n, where n is equal to two to the m for some non-negative integer m. So that means that in the range zero to n, there are n, which is two to the m possible numbers. All right, <clears throat> now, you can start simple where instead of thinking about two to the M immediately, let's try, try some small examples. So when M equals, let's see, can M equals zero? Uh, M could equal zero, but M equals zero is not super interesting. M equals zero, that means N is one. So you would just always return the same number. So let's not look at M equals zero. Let's look at M equals one. So that means you have to generate a random integer between zero and two. So the possible choices, are zero and one, All right? That's easy. We can just flip a single coin and that gives us either, uh, it gives us a random integer between zero and one and both are equally likely. What about M equals two? Well, then there's four choices, zero, one, two, three. And <clears throat> you can think about how you might generate this. But one trick that you will see in these problems that involve bits is you might want to write them in binary. We can express these choices in binary, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And then it becomes more clear about how we might generate these numbers. Right? Notice that we have two bits, and each bit is either a 0 or a 1. Right? That's why there are four different possibilities, because there's two choices for the first bit and two for the second bit. And each of these can be generated independently. So this should give you a sense of what the overall algorithm should be. It would be depending on what M is, so calculate what M is, flip M coins, and then each coin, well, each coin is a bit, you put all those bits together as one M bit number, and that is your random number. So let's actually write that in. If random number, let's pass in, Let's pass in M just for simplicity. Let's pass in M because that's easy to use. All right, then we flip M bits. So our number is zero. And we're going to flip M bits. So I equals one. Oops. <clears throat> and then at each step, what we're going to do is we're going to we're gonna add that power of two. So what you can do is you can do number plus equals whoops, let me rewrite this I equals. So the bit we call the random number generator 
generate it. And then to our number, right? We want to add, well, we have a m bit representation of the number and we just want to convert to binary. If you remember from CS107, the way you convert it to binary is you multiply by, you multiply the bit. Well, you add the bit and then you can shift it upwards by i places, well, i minus one places. All right. So if you want to write it in C syntax, like you would do in CS107, you write it like that. But honestly, I just prefer to write it like this. Okay, and then you can assume that you can do this uh, efficiently. I guess another way you can write this is you can do number and e or equals, right? That or equals sets the bit, and then you do or equals bit shift upwards by i minus one places. Right, but this is an algorithms class, it's not a CS107 class. So you don't have to worry about that. You can really just write this. All right. And we're just going to assume that you can calculate this efficiently. Now, there is a more efficient way to do it. And uh, I'll write the code. It's a little tricky to understand. But uh, another way you, yeah, you could write this code is you could say something like plus equals the bit and then number times equals two. <clears throat> All right. What this is doing is it's essentially saying we're going to create the first bit, let's say it's one, and then we're going to shift it up. We're going to shift the entire number up so that it looks like this. And then we're going to put the next bit, zero, shift all the numbers up by one place so we get something like this. And then we put the next bit, one, and then we shift everything up again. And we just repeat this process where we're going to put the next number, put the next bit in, shift everything up, put the next bit in, shift everything up. And this also works. All right, let's think about what the runtime of this is. How many times do we have to call our, our bit function? Well, this is a deterministic algorithm, right? This runs exactly O of m times, and each the body of the loop runs O of one time. So the runtime is O one. Oops, not O of one, O of m. Uh, my iPad stuck. One second. Fix the iPad. It's the runtime. So. All right. So the runtime is all that. Right, and that matches, yeah, that matches this requirement above. All right, well, let's do part B. So part B, we're gonna use the randomly guess and check paradigm. And it's asking us to now generate numbers in a range from zero to N, but N doesn't necessarily have to be a power of two. All right, let's keep this algorithm up here in case it's, we're gonna use it later. Uh, let's call it, let's give it a different, let's call it random number power of two. Two. <clears throat> right, because this algorithm might be helpful, right? We, when we generate a number, we're going to generate an m bit number between zero and two to the m. Now, how does this help us get a random number if we, like our value of n, right? The, doesn't necessarily have to be a power of two. The answer is we can use this function and we can generate a number. And then once we finish generating that number, if the number is out of our range, then we just discard that number and try again, right? Can you convince yourself that if we keep generating numbers and then we wait until we get one number that is in our range, right? If we do this process, the final numbers we end up picking are definitely going to be uniform in that acceptable range from zero to n, right? Because each number within that range is equally likely, and we're not going to stop until we get a number in that range. Okay, so yeah, that is the algorithm. What we're going to do is we're going to guess random number, give it n, and then what we're going to do is we're going to just going to repeat while true 
number is equal to random number power of two of something. We don't know what that something is. Yep. And then if number is less than n, return number. All right. And then we're just going to keep repeating. We're going to repeat this algorithm. Well, not algorithm. We're going to repeat this loop again and again. We're just going to keep generating numbers until we get one that works. All right. So what do we plug in for m? Well, let's think about it. <clears throat> if our range is, let's use a concrete example. If our range is from 0 through 10, uh, so if n, n is 10, so that means we don't include 10. All right, and what range should we generate our numbers? Well, we need a range that is larger than this range, right? Because we need to be able to generate numbers, and then only if we get a number that is within our this smaller range do we return. So the numbers we generate from need to be from a larger range. So what's the next larger range that is a power of two? Well, we can do from zero all the way up to 16, 14, 15, and then not including 16. All right, so in general, how do we, given n, how do we get this larger range, right? How do we get that we want to generate from uh, a range of zero to six to 15. So to 15, that means we want two to the fourth. So M here is four. The question is, how do we get this four? Well, you can see how to calculate this expression. N, our goal is to try to figure out what range N fits in, and it fits in the range between two to the third and two to the fourth, right? So to figure out what this M, this range is, Right, we can use logs. Taking log of both sides, we get that m minus one log n less than m. All right, so we want to use log n somehow. Now, log base 10, no, not log base 10, log base 2 of 10 right, is between 4 and 3. So we want 4. All right, that suggests that when we come up with the range log base 2 of n, we want to round up. Right. If, if this is some floating point, like three point something, then that tells us that we want four bits. So the number of bits we want, m, is equal to log base two of n, you round it upwards. So here, m is equal to log base two of n, round it up, and then you plug that in into m. All right, and that is our algorithm. This is called the randomly check or randomly guess, check, answer, and repeat. All right, randomly guess, check, answer, and then repeat. This is super common. Whenever you find that there's an efficient way to guess an answer and also check an answer, for example, like on the majority element problem on homework three, then you will frequently use an algorithm like this. Now let's analyze the runtime. Right. So to analyze the runtime, we want to calculate what is the probability that we succeed on one single iteration. Right. What is probability we succeed on one iteration? Okay. So the answer to that is it depends. Right. It depends on what m and n are. So let's look at our range. If we, if the numbers, so the numbers that are acceptable are from zero, one, two, all the way up to n. So these are, or n minus one, these are the acceptable numbers. And then the possible numbers, the numbers in red are zero, one, two, through. So passing n minus one, and it goes up to um, m, <coughs> two to the m minus one. <coughs> Right, or if we plug in what m is, this is two to the log base two of n rounded upwards minus one. All right, so what is the, so how many numbers are acceptable? Well, the numbers that are acceptable are, their n numbers are acceptable out of the two to the m numbers. So n divided by two to the 
log base two of n minus one. All right, now this number depends on what n is, right? And we don't really want an n to go into our calculation because that then it becomes kind of complicated, right? We have a bunch of floors. It's a bit annoying. Oh, my bad, there's no minus one here, All right? Because we're indexing from zero and we're going to uh, two to the log base two of n rounded upwards minus one. All right, so let's try to simplify this. And the claim is that this is upper bounded by one half. Try to figure out why. Or rather, this is not upper bounded. This is lower bounded by one half. This number is at least one half. Okay. So one way you could justify that is, well, we know that two to the, we, well, we know that uh, the, the ceiling of two of log base two of n rounded upwards is definitely greater than log base two, right? Because we're just rounding up. So that means two to the log, log base two of n is rounded upwards is definitely greater than equal to two to the log base two of n. What does that mean? That means that, well, if you wrote, because these numbers appear in the denominator, we know that one over two to the log base two of n is less than or equal to one over two to the log base two of n. This one you round up, right? And then you can just multiply both sides by n. And we, then we get our, our expression. Um, let's see, what am I missing here? Log base two of n. So this tells us that this expression is equal to one. All right, that's not the bound we wanted, but we were close. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, this is some trial and error, right? This was the, not the bound we wanted, but here's another idea. Instead of round, looking at rounding upwards, let's try to see if we can come up with another bound for this. All right, we want this to be less than or equal to two to the something, because in the end, we want our inequality to be in the other direction. So another idea we can have is the, is the ceiling of log base two, well, log base two of n rounded upwards, that's always gonna be less than log base two of n plus one, right? Because if rounding upwards, you're gonna add some small number to round up. But that's always gonna be less than if you just straight up added a, like one to it, All right? Now this is the bound we wanted. The plus one is what helps us with our one half there. So we can do the same process again, two to the log base two of n is greater than or equal to n over two to the log base two of n plus one. And this expression simplifies to n over 2n, which is one half. All right, so this shows that the probability that we succeed on one iteration is at least one half. So probability that we succeed on one iteration is at least one half. Right, then we can calculate what is the what is the expected number of times it will take for us to succeed. All right, if it takes one iteration, then how many times will it take to succeed? Well, we can model that as a random variable, right? X, let's call that the number of iterations to succeed, right? And you should remember from the CS109 review, this is exactly a geometric random variable of parameter P is, well, P is at least one half. Right, what's the expected value of a geometric random variable? It is one over p. So that means that the, ex the expected number of iterations to succeed is less than or equal to one over one half, which is two. So this means on average, in expectation, we will take two iterations for our algorithm to succeed. All right, then what is the overall runtime? Overall expected runtime. Well, we're going to repeat this, like our loop many, many times. So the runtime is the expected number of times to run the loop times the, the runtime of one loop. We said the runtime of one loop was theta of, uh, I think it was theta of m, which was log n. So the, and the expected number of times we run the loop, we said here was two. So 
the runtime is theta of log n. Right, notice that because our probability p, because we were able to find, find a fixed constant to bound the probability, that means that we can just repeat this process again and again, and we're guaranteed that the expected number of times that this algorithm runs is going to be a constant. That means our overall expected runtime is just going to be our original runtime for one loop multiplied by a constant. Okay, that's a nice thing because then our, our runtime doesn't change. It's still log n, still very efficient. All right, that concludes this video. This is a very common concept that you'll see in this class where you analyze an algorithm by, by creating a you know, guess, guess answer, check answer, repeat. Then you calculate the probability that you succeed on one iteration. In fact, let me just write this down. Yes, answer, check answer, repeat, pattern. Okay, one, you start by writing the algorithm. Right, it almost always looks like while true, guess answer, check answer. Well, if correct, return answer. Right, this is like the template for a for this pattern. And then when you analyze the algorithm, you determine the bound probability. You guess right answer. All right, then you can model as an expected value number of iterations is equal to 1 over p because it's a geometric random variable, and then the expected runtime would be uh, expected number of iterations times runtime of one loop, one iteration. All right, this is the guess answer, check, answer, repeat par paradigm, and you will see this a ton. All right, so um, there are more problems you can try in the, in the, I guess it's in the midterm review section, so definitely try those out. All right, thanks.